What is it that you have that so many people who are unbelievably brilliant at engineering or are incredibly good managers or bold business people or what have you, what is it that you have, do you think, that enables you to make this stuff happen? Um, well, I, uh, I, 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 first of all, I, don't, I certainly don't think I can you know, do anything or, or uh, do most things that people think are impossible because I think a lot of people, of what people think are, is impossible, is actually impossible. Um, so, <laughs> but you know, occasionally it's not. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm trying, trying to, you know, I, I guess it's. Uh, I don't think I've said this before. I think it's helpful to have kind of a physics framework for for looking at things. Um, you know, do a first principles analysis, look for negative feedback. Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, like r really believe in what you're doing, but but not just from a blind faith standpoint. Like to have really thought about it and say, okay, this this is true. I'm convinced it's true, and I've I've tried to, every angle to figure out if it's untrue, and uh, s sort negative feedback to, to to figure out maybe if I'm maybe wrong. But then after all that, it, okay, it still seems like. This this is the the right way to go. Then that that I think gives one a fundamental conviction and an ability to convey that conviction to others um, and to convince them to join. And that's what a company is. It's a group of people who come together to create a, a product of some kind. And so if you, if you can convey that in, in, and and answer the concerns that people have, convince them that this is something that needs to be done. It's important and there is a path to do it, even if that path has a lot of danger associated with it, and risk, and, and maybe it won't succeed. Um, but people can understand, okay, this is why it's important, and even if the odds are that it won't succeed, it's worth trying to do it, um, then I think you can create a, a great company. Um, and just being really rigorous in making that assessment, um, because people are, tend, tend to a natural human tendency is wishful thinking. Um, so a, a challenge for entrepreneurs is to say, well, what's the difference between really believing in your ideals and sticking, sticking to them versus pursuing some unrealistic dream that right. doesn't actually have merit? And it's, it's, that, is a, it, that is a really difficult thing to, to tell. You, can you tell the difference between those two things? Right. You know? So you need to be sort of very rigorous um, in, in your self-analysis. Uh, self um, I think certainly extremely tenacious, uh, and um, and then just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in, you know, eighty hour, eighty to hundred hour weeks every week. Gosh. And it's then a lot of work. That, that the, all those things improve the odds of success. Okay. Um, right. I mean, if, if 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 other people are putting in forty hour work weeks and you're putting in hundred hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing. You know that in in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. And then uh, I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we we we, we reason by analogy. Um, it's we're doing this because it's like something else that was done, mm -hmm. or it's like what. Um, other people are doing. Me too type but, ideas. Yeah, it's slight, well, it's, yeah, it's slight iterations take, yeah. on, on, on a theme. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and it's, it, cause it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true, or, or as sure as possible is true, and then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. Um, Give but, me an example of that. Like, what's one thing that you've, you've done that on that you feel has worked for you? Sure. So, um, somebody could say, um, in fact, people do, uh, that factory packs are really expensive, and that's just the way they'll always be, because that's the way they've been in the past. Um, you're like, well, no, that's, that's pretty dumb. You know, because if if uh, if you applied that reasoning to anything new, 
that ha then you, you wouldn't be able to, to ever get to that new thing. Right. Um, so, um, you know, it's like you can't say, oh, you know, horses, well, nobody wants a car because horses are great and we're used to them and they can eat grass. And there's lots of grass all over the place and, you know, there's not like a, there's no gasoline that people can buy. So people are never going to never get, never going to get cars. Right. Um, but people did say that. You know? um, and, and, and for batteries, they, they would say, oh, it's going to cost, you know, historically it's cost six, six hundred dollars per, uh, six hundred dollars um, uh, per kilowatt hour. And so it's not going to be much better than that in the future. And you say, no, okay, well, what, what, are, what are the batteries made of? So, so first principles would be to say, okay, what are the material constituents of the batteries? Mm -hmm. What is the spot market value of the material constituents? So you can say, okay, it's got cobalt, nickel, aluminum, carbon, um, and some polymers for separation, and a seal can. So break that down in, or, on a material basis and say, okay, what, if we bought that in the London Metal Exchange, what would each of those things cost? Like, oh, geez, uh, it's like $80 uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you just need to think of clever ways to take those materials and combine them into the shape of a battery cell, and you can have batteries that are much, much cheaper than anyone realizes. How do you think about making a decision when everyone tells you this is a crazy idea? Or where do you get the internal strength to do that? Well, first of all, I'd say I actually think I, I, think I fear, feel fear quite strongly. Um, so it's not as though I just have the absence of fear. I, I feel it quite strongly. Um, but there, there are just times when something is important enough, you believe in it enough, that you, you do it in spite of the fear. So speaking so, of important things. Like people shouldn't think, oh, I, 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 I should, people shouldn't think, well, I feel fear about this and therefore I shouldn't do it. Um, it's normal to, be, to feel fear. Like you'd have to, there'd be something mentally wrong <laughs> if you didn't feel fear. Um, so you just feel it and let the importance of it drive you to do it anyway? Yeah, I, you know, I, actually something that can be helpful is fatalism, uh, to some degree. Um, if, you just, if you just accept the probabilities, um, then that diminishes fear. Uh, so, um, when starting SpaceX, I thought the odds of success were less than 10%. Um, and I just accepted that actually probably I would just lose, lose everything. Um, but that maybe we would make some progress. If we could just move the ball forward, even if we died, maybe some other company could pick up the baton and move and keep moving it forward. Um, so that would still do some good. Um, yeah, same with Tesla. I thought you know, the odds of a car company succeeding were extremely low. I would uh, definitely advise people who are starting a company to expect a, a, a long period of quite High difficulty. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, as long as uh, people stay super focused on creating the absolute best product or service that really delights their end customer, I, if they stay focused on that, then um, if, if you basically if, if if you get it such that your customers want you to mm. succeed, mm. then then you probably will. All right. Uh, you have to focus on the customer and delivering for them. Yeah. Make yeah. sure if your customers love you, you will you, your odds of success are dramatically higher. Yeah. Right, first of all, I'd say starting a business is not for everyone. You know, so uh, generally, starting a business, I'd say number one is have a high pain threshold. <laughs> That's it. Um, there's a friend of mine who's got a good saying, which is that starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Okay, that's, um, that's generally what happens because um, when you first start a company, there's lots of optimism and things, things are great. And then, so happiness at first is high. Then you encounter all sorts of issues uh, and happiness will steadily decline. <laughs> and then you'll go through a whole world of hurt. One does have to be focused on the short term and money coming in when creating a company because otherwise the company will, will die. So the, the, I think that a lot of times people think like creating companies going to be fun. I would say it's not, it's really not that fun. I mean, there are periods of fun and there are, there are periods of where it's, where it's just awful. Um, and particularly if you're the CEO of the company, 
um, you actually have a distillation of all the worst problems in the company. Um, so there's no point in spending your time on things that are going right. So you only spend on things on your time on things that are going wrong. And, and there are things that are going wrong that other people can't, can't take care of. So you have like the worst. You have a filter for the crappest problem in the company. <laughs> the most pernicious and painful problem. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, it's it, I think you have to feel quite compelled to do it. Um, and have a, a fairly high pain threshold. And there's a friend of mine who, who says like starting a company is like staring into the abyss and, and eating glass. Um, and there's some truth to that. Um, the staring into the abyss part is that you're going to be constantly facing the, the um, extermination of the company. Because uh, most, most startups fail. Uh, it's like 90%, probably 99% of, of startups fail. So, uh, so you, you, that, that's the staring into the abyss part. You're constantly saying, okay, this, if, if, if I don't get this right, the company will die. Um, it's going to be quite stressful. Quite stressful. And, and then um, the eating glass part is you've got, you've, got to do, you've got to do the problems. You've got to, you've got to work on the problems that the company needs you to work on, not the problems you want to work on. And, and so that, the, that's, you end up working on problems that, that uh, you'd really wish you weren't working on. And so that's, that's the eating glass part. Um, and that goes on for a long time. So how do you keep your focus on the big picture when you're constantly faced with, we could be out of business in a month? Well, it's, it's just a very small percentage of mental energy is on the, on the big picture. Like, you know, you know, you know where you, you're generally head, heading for, and, and the, the actual path is going to be some sort of zigzaggy thing in that direction. Um, and try not to deviate too far from the path that, that, that you want to be on, but you're going to have to do that to some degree. Um, but I, I don't want to diminish the, I mean, I think the, prod, the profit motive is a, is, a, is a good one if the rules of an industry are properly set up. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong with profit. In fact, profit just means that uh, people are paying you more for the, the, whatever you're doing than you're spending to create it. That's a good thing. <laughs> and and if, if, you're not, if, if that's not the case, then you'll be out of business, and rightfully so. Because you're, you're, you're not adding enough value. You have the same fun from innovation as from business, running a business? Um, well, I mean, or would I guess, you rather to be yeah. just an innovator, engineer, instead of a business owner or runner? I mean, I'd love to just do innovation and just do engineering. Yeah. Um, but you raise a good point because, you know, a lot of life in general, in any job, there's like you have to do your chores. Mm -hmm. You know, there's... Because no, nobody else is can do that for you, right? Well, it's, yeah, to be, I think to be successful at almost anything, you can't, it, you have to do the tough stuff and as well as the enjoyable stuff. You have to do the boring stuff as well as the non-boring stuff. Mm. Um, and if you don't do your chores, then bad things will happen. But yeah. if they don't do the things that they don't like to do, then the company will be in trouble. Yeah. Like you have to, t you, you basically, like it's more fun to cook the meal than to, 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 to clean the dishes, mm -hmm. okay? But you need to clean the dishes. <laughs> you need to do both. Yes, you need to do both, exactly. At Tesla, your goal has been to make a better car. And you've done that with an electric vehicle that people covet, that has quite a cult following, um, that's upgradable. Um, but you also want to achieve, and your turn of phrase is very nice, um, or, or try to achieve this platonic ideal of a car, right? To reach uh, yeah. perfection. So what does the perfect car look like? Well, I mean, I do, I do use that phrase with our engineering design team that aspirationally um, we're in pursuit of the platonic ideal of the perfect car. Yeah. Um, and um, who knows what that looks like actually, but it's, I, you, you want to try to make every element of the car um, as as flawless as possible, um, and there will always be, you know, some um, degree of imperfection. But um, try to minimize that um, and, and create a car that is just delightful in every way. Um, and I think if you do that, then the the rest kind of takes care of itself. Whatever you're doing is a great product or service. It has to be really great. And I go back to what I was saying earlier, where um, if you're a new company. I mean, unless it's like some new industry or, or new market that, if it's an untapped market, or then, then 
uh, you have more ability to you, this this the standard is lower for your product or service but if you're entering anything where there's an existing marketplace against large entrenched competitors then your product or service needs to be much better than theirs it can't be a little bit better because then you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and they say why would you buy it as a consumer you're always going to buy the trusted brand unless there's a big difference so a lot of times uh you know entrepreneur will come up with something which is only slightly better um and it's it's not it can't just be slightly better it's got to be a lot better uh number three i'd say is constantly seek criticism uh a a well a well thought out critique of whatever you're doing is as valuable as gold um and you should seek that from everyone you can but particularly your friends um usually your friends know what's wrong but they don't want to tell you because they don't want to hurt you um so let you off sort of your Yeah. yeah, so they you know they say oh I wouldn't encourage my friend so I'm, t- I'm not going to tell him what I think is wrong with this product. Yeah. It doesn't mean your friends are right. Uh but very often they are right. Um and you at least want to listen very carefully to what they say. And to everyone, if you're looking for basically you you should take the approach that that you're wrong. Um you know that 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 you the entrepreneur are wrong your goal is to be less wrong so but you've also said in terms of where you want to go that that developing a high performance sports car is not what this is about absolutely this yes. is about something else and you yes. want to develop a, a sedan yeah the, the 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 whole purpose behind tesla the reason um i put so much of my my time and and money into helping create the uh, the, the business is uh is is we want to serve as a catalyst for accelerating the electric car revolution um the uh the the price of gas at the pump does not reflect the true cost of gasoline um because you have a consumption of a, of of a public good um it's it's one of the most it, it's it's really a common problem in economics you have the same thing in 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 fishing where because there's no cost to to fishing stocks people just overfish and you know and, and you you have disaster that 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 ensues right. and and here we we're, we're not paying for the cost of of the CO2 concentration in the oceans and atmospheres we're not paying for all these the ancillary effects yeah. of the wars and all the other things at 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 the at the gas pump so you effectively have a subsidy taking place at at, at the gas pump because of that so the only way to bridge that is is with innovation um is to try to try, try to make electric cars better sooner than they would otherwise be I think a successful entrepreneur has probably come in all sizes shapes and flavors. Um I'm not sure there's any one one particular thing. Um uh for me, you know, some of the things I've described already are, I think are very important. I think uh really um uh, an, an obsessive uh nature with respect to the quality of the product um it is very important. Uh yeah, so you know, being obsessive compulsive is is a good thing in this context. Um uh r- really r- really liking what you do what whatever area that you get into um given that you know even if you if you're the best the best there's always a chance of failure so i think it's important that you really like whatever you're doing um uh, if if you don't like it life is too short um you know i i'd say if, if and and also if if you if you like what you're doing you think about it even when you're not working i mean you, you're, it'll just it, it's it's something that your mind is drawn to um and and if you don't like it you you just really can't make it work i think and if you ask me he asked me what I was going to do after paypal and i thought well you know i was wondering like um i'd like to get involved in space but i i just didn't think there's anything i could do as an individual um and uh but i was curious as to when we when we nasa would be sending a a a team to mars because that was always going to be the thing to do after the moon um i figured that that there'd be some plan and i just go to the website and and i could read the you know the schedule um <laughs> and <laughs> then mars occurs like, oh yeah it's like okay 2017 good okay um but it, but actually there wasn't anything on on the website and um <laughs> or at least i thought like am i can i not find it like what's going on here um and is it secret i don't know 
Uh, so, but it turned out that, um, that NASA had done a study on what it would cost to send to, to do a um, manned Mars mission, and uh, this was under Bush the first. And uh, he, in, his, in his first, he asked for a 90-day study shortly after uh, taking office, and NASA came back with a $500 billion price tag. And he said, okay, maybe not. Billions uh, of B. That's yeah. when $500 mm -hmm. billion dollars was serious money um, <laughs> uh, yeah, for the government. Um, so, uh, so, so then that got totally shelved, and it was like you were not allowed to talk about any kind of crewed mission to Mars at NASA. Hmm. Um, anyway, so I, I, but I thought, well, uh, if I can do something that would um, galvanize public interest, that, and, and then that public interest would translate to uh, additional appropriations for NASA and increase the, their budget, then, then maybe they could do it. So, the first, so actually what I sort of thinking I would do is uh, send a, a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars with seeds and dehydrated gel, and then upon landing, hydrate the gel or grow the plants. And the public tends to respond to precedents and superlatives. So this would be the furthest that life's ever traveled, the first life on Mars. I tried to, try to figure out how to do this with the proceeds that I had from, from PayPal. Um, and uh, I was able to figure out how to get the cost of the, the spacecraft down and the communications and, and, and the um, little greenhouse and everything. But the one thing I couldn't compress was the cost of launch, because mm -hmm. there are only a few options. And the US options are way too expensive. Um, and so I ended up going to Russia three times to try to buy uh, the, the biggest ICBM in the Russian nuclear fleet. Um, That's where I'd start, yeah. Yeah. Go big that or go was, home, uh, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. There were some strange trips, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, there's like virtually, like you can buy any. It's a very capitalist society in <laughs> some ways. Uh, um, so I actually did negotiate a deal to, <laughs> to buy two of the ICBMs minus the nukes. Um, and, um, but, but I came to the conclusion after that third trip that um, it, it wouldn't really matter. Like if, if we, I actually came to the conclusion that my initial premise was, was, was wrong. Mm. Um, because I, I actually think there's, there's a tremendous amount of will uh, in the American population particularly uh, to, uh, to explore. Um, uh, the United States, you know, maybe more than any other country, um, is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Um, and it's really fundamental to psyche. So if people think there's a way, I think it would actually get a lot of support. Mm -hmm. um, but but they need, it, it can't be just banging your head against the wall. You've got to believe that this can be done without mm -hmm. breaking the federal budget. Um, so uh, that's when I said, okay, well, is there some way to affect the cost of space transport? And, um, and, is, or, and, and so I, I got together with a group of people over a series of Saturdays just to just try to understand, is there something super ex fundamentally super expensive about rockets, or, or can the cost be substantially improved? Um, and um, I had, we had a bunch of those kind of brainstorming sessions, and I couldn't, see, I couldn't see any fundamental obstacle to improving the cost of rockets, so mm -hmm. that, that's when I started SpaceX. It's like, I'll just build them myself. And, um, yeah. And then... But like oh, I said, at that point, I would say the, the probability of success was definitely less than 50%. I thought it would most likely not succeed. Um, but it was worth a try. My time is mostly split uh, well, it's between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla. And of course, I, I try to spend um, uh, it's a part of every week at OpenAI. Um, so I spend, most, I spend basically half a day at OpenAI most weeks. Um, and then and then I have some open AI stuff that happens during the week. But other than that, it's really SpaceX and Tesla. And what do you SpaceX do when you're Tesla. at SpaceX or Tesla? Like, what does your time look like there? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of people think I, I must spend a lot of time with media or, or on businessy things, but actually almost, uh, almost all my time, like 80% of it is spent on engineering and design. In engineering and design. So it's um, developing next generation product at, that's 80% of it. Um, you probably don't remember this, a very long time ago, many, many years, you took me on a tour of SpaceX. And uh, the most impressive thing was that you knew every detail of the rocket and every piece of engineering that went into it. Uh, and I don't think many people get that about you. Yeah, I think a lot of people think I'm kind of a business person or something, which is fine, like business is fine. But um, like I, uh, but really it's, you know, it's like at SpaceX, 
Uh, Gwen Shotwell is Chief Operating Officer. She kind of manages um, uh, legal, finance, um, sales, um, and kind of general business activity. And then my time is almost entirely with the uh, engineering team working on improving our, the, the Falcon 9 and the, the uh, Dragon spacecraft and developing the Mars Colonial architecture. Um, and then at Tesla, it's working on the Model 3 and the, you know, some in the design studio, typically um, half a day a week, um, dealing with this aesthetics and, and uh, look and feel things. And, and then most of the rest of the week is just going through engineering of, of, of the car itself, as well as engineering of um, I, I've heard your response to the question, but these guys need to hear it. Why is Mars important? Why does Mars matter? Sure. Well, I think the it's it's really a fundamental decision we need to make um, as a civilization. Uh, it, you know, what, what kind of future do we want? Do we want a future where we are forever confined to one planet until some eventual extinction event, however far in the future that might occur, um, or do we want to become a multi-planet species? Um, and, and then ultimately be out there among the stars and be among many planets, many star systems. And I think the latter is a far more exciting and inspiring future than the former. Um, and, and Mars is the next uh, natural step. Um, in fact, it's the only planet we really have a shot at, at establishing a self-sustaining city on. Um, and, uh, and I think once we do establish such a city, there will be a strong forcing function for the improvement of spaceflight technology that will then enable us to uh, establish colonies elsewhere in the solar system and ultimately extend beyond, the, beyond our solar system. Um, and, um, and so there's the defensive reason of uh, protecting the future of humanity, ensuring that the light of consciousness is not extinguished uh, should some calamity befall Earth. Uh, but also, and, and that, that's the defensive reason, but personally I find the more, the, what what um, get, gets me more excited is is the fact that this would be an incredible adventure. Mm. I mean, it'd be like the greatest adventure ever. Mm. Mm. Um, and it, it would be exciting and inspiring. And there need to be things that excite and inspire people. Yeah. You'd have to be, you know, reasons why you get up in the morning. It can't just be solving problems. It's got to be, yeah, something, something great's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this at length yesterday. It's, it's not an exit strategy or a backup plan right. for humankind <laughs> no. when Earth fails. Right. It's also to inspire people on Earth, yeah. right? And to transcend and to, think, to go beyond our um, mental limits of what we think we can achieve. Right. I mean, you think of sort of how incredible the Apollo program was. And just, yeah. I mean, if, if you ask anyone and say, Name, name some of humanity's greatest achievements in yeah. the 20th century. The, the Apollo program landing on the moon would, would may, in many if not most places, be number one. Do we be considering one trips, one way only trips to Mars? Uh, what's the best uh, approach to, to colonize uh, the planet? Is it, uh, what's your view? Is that socially acceptable? Do you think people will sign up to do it? I think there's plenty of people who have signed up for a one way trip to Mars. Um, <laughs> but, but, Maybe but, if I could, we could have a show of hands, who would consider such an option? Really? I see some, not many, but perhaps enough for a couple of missions. So it's certainly, the, <laughs> certainly be enough. I, mean, I think it's sort of like, is, is it a one way mission and then you die? Or is it a one way mission and you get resupplied? That's a big difference. <laughs> We're for the second option. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's a, it ends up being a moot point because y you want to bring the spaceship back. Like these spaceships are expensive. Okay, they're hard to build. <laughs> you can't just leave them there. <laughs> so whether or not people want to come back or not is kind of like they can jump on if they want, but they need the spaceship back. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, it's kind of weird. Like it was like huge collection of spaceships on Mars over time. We were like, <laughs> it was like, maybe we should send them back. I mean, of course we should send them back.